Good evening, Jacksonville. Thanks for joining us on the Marketing Advisor Radio Show. Once again, my name is Treg Kazik. I'm joined with my trusty sidekick, Rusty Winter. I think I am identified as a sidekick on the website. You are. I don't I, appreciate that. Well, I, we're going to make some changes around here. I thought it was funny. <laughs> but it's good to be back. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. We have some very special guests here today. Uh, Scott Grant, he is the president of Stanfast Asset Management. He's also a published author and columnist uh, in a number of local newsletters and, and newspapers here in, in Jacksonville, Florida. He's a local historian. He's a renaissance guy and just an all-around swell guy. Welcome, Scott. Oh, thanks. That was a, that was a really nice intro, by the way. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I practiced for hours. <laughs> for hours? So this morning, huh? The, uh, I saw him doing it in the mirror. While he was shaving. It was a little, a little now weird. I gotta take, I'm going to have to take you with me on the road just to get that introduction every time. Speaking of taking with you on the road, we also have your lovely publicist Jennifer Price. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here in studio. Um, as you well know, this is a marketing and a business show, and uh, our audience is accustomed to gleaning one or two golden nuggets every every week, right, from, from us here at the Marketing Advisor Radio Show. So we're hoping that you're going to help contribute to that to that uh, wealth of knowledge and share with us, you know, some of the things that you've done with uh, you know, with Sandfast Asset Management and how you've gone about marketing, um, you know, your services. Okay, you, you, you'd like to start off talking about some marketing ideas? Well, I wait would, a second. Yeah. The audience also knows that I am a sucker for nostalgia and a sucker for history. All right. Well, and you... I'm often, they also know I like to get off topic sometimes. This is true. So, can Hence we just decide first? Trick. Tell us, so, you know, you were described as a historian. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, areas that you specialize in? Well, you know, I've always been fascinated generally with local history and so no matter where i lived um some of the local history uh excited me here the ones the really two stories but the one that we were talking about before we started uh is the submarine attack off of jack's beach in uh, april 10th of 1942 and the thing that fascinates me about it is that there were thousands of people on the beach uh, it was 9 30 at night on a friday night jacksonville beach was hopping the bars were full there was a band on the pier and there are people in the Ferris wheel. There are people on the roller coaster who actually, and imagine being a kid, being in a, on a Ferris wheel, maybe even at the top, and looking out, and all of a sudden there's an explosion out to sea, three to four miles, a huge explosion, one that uh, passing Eastern Airlines flight said rose 500 feet into the air. Wow. And yeah. the terror you would have felt? Um, and I think maybe that's kind of what fascinates me is, is that I can somehow able to put myself in that position and imagine how horrifying it would have been. Absolutely. You know, and those guys were scared. They th they, uh, in fact, they start running around trying to turn off all the lights at the beach because they're shared, scared that the uh, Nazis are going to shell the city. Wow. Yeah. I, I can imagine that. I can, I can do that same little exercise and put myself in that position. That would be terrifying well three to four miles isn't that far no. for a big explosion like that that's got to feel like it's right up against the beach when you're in that situation well i think it did i, I you know i have a harder time visualizing exactly how far it would have been and what it would have looked like but it, it would have been closer than you imagine well Treg was around back then he just wasn't on the beach that day <laughs> <I> was not <laughs> <laughs> all right so we've satisfied my urge for nostalgia and history now we can well, get you know, to I mean, business well, and as marketing. As, since we started with history let me just <laughs> yeah. tell you the other sure one sure i'd the, the thing that I'm writing for Folio right now is a story about 1964. And I think the summer of 1964 is pretty exciting, too, because down in St. Augustine, you had all the civil uh, rights problems, you know, and they were marching every single day. Martin Luther King comes down and gets arrested. Um, all these events are occurring. And, of course, they passed the Civil Rights Act in the, Act in the summer of 64, partially because of what was happening in St. Augustine. And against that backdrop... Uh, there's a Beatles concert on November or excuse me on September 11th, 1964, in August, 1964 at the Gator Bowl. Oh, yeah. okay. As <laughs> we have actually, we have a pair of tickets from that in oh, the studio somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Can I get a picture with those? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll but find, but we'll it's, track it's, now. it's funny you asked where it was yeah. because Ringo Starr asked the same question during the <laughs> press interview. <laughs> oh, gee. Where was the concert? And the woman was uh, Jean Morris from Tampa. Yeah. And she's a famous kind of TV personality from that era, and she's kind of corrected him 
him the way I corrected you. Oh, it's the Gator Bowl. Oh. He says. <laughs> the Gator Bowl. It still is the Gator Bowl, right? Still is. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, sure. it's Everbank now, I guess, but yeah. they still play the Gator Bowl there. But uh, yeah. So then, and the day before the Beatles come, uh, Hurricane Dora hits. So LBJ comes that morning of That's September. A busy summer. Yeah. September 11th, and. Uh, or excuse me, September 10th, which is when the hurricane comes. He comes the next morning, September 11th. He leaves. The Beatles show up. They have to nail Ringo's drum set to the stage because they're still so windy because the hurricane hit the day before. Mm -hmm. Right? We know what that's like. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, Bob Hayes, who's a Jacksonville native, Robert Lee Hayes, also known as the Bullet, the world's fastest man, yep. is training for the Olympics in Tokyo, which are late that year. Summer Olympics are not until October. On October 14th, Martin Luther King gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. On October 15th, the very next day, uh, Bob Hayes sets a uh, record in the 100-yard dash. Wow. Is he finally in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, he's in both the Football Hall of Fame and the Track Hall of Fame. Okay, he, he was a, like, he got in late, though, right? I, yes, I thought he did. there was a he lot of debate get, around he, that. Well, and he actually was, uh, I think he was posthumously. That's right. That's so right. Uh, there was debate, too, about the person that accepted whether... The person accepted for him read a letter that he purportedly wrote, and I know there's some controversy as to whether it was real or not. Yeah, sure. But Bob Hayes, the only guy to have a Olympic gold medal and a Super Bowl ring. Wow. Yeah. Two things I'd like to have. Did not know that. A Jacksonville son. I'll tell That's you what. Right. A lot of history here in Northeast Florida, <laughs> and um, in addition to financial advice and uh, uh, writing and publishing works, um, original. Um, you can certainly contact Scott for anything Northeast Florida history related as well. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> At least those two topics. I'm, right. I'm, I'm good to go on those two topics. Well, very good. Well, I want to ask you, though, because I do want to bring it back to marketing. How do you leverage your passion for Northeast Florida history uh, and parlay it into a, a net a positive for Standfast Asset Management? Well, you know, we, we have been going around giving the speech, and the speech about the um, – um, the, the the torpedo attack off Jackson Be Jack's Beach in 1942 um, has been very popular. And in fact, uh, uh, Rusty asked us to go to his Rotary Club when we came in. That's so right. we added to the list Love of Rotary Clubs. Um, the one thing I would say is, you know, I have a passion for it. I think if I was going out trying to do these kind of things merely with the idea that it would bring me financial gain some point down the road, it wouldn't be successful. I mean, people can see that I'm genuinely passionate um, about these events. And I'm passionate about the stock market, too. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I believe I've heard a term for that. If you don't have a – if it's a fake passion, it's called no uh, – all hat and no cattle. That's that's what they call it. So. I like that one. Yeah. I do like that one. Yeah. So um, let, we've only got a minute left, but I want to give you an opportunity to um, share anything else uh, history related. Rusty, if you had any questions, I want to satisfy. If I keep asking, we're going to spend the entire spend the show, show on, on history, which which is we fine can. with me, but I don't think we we want to do that. So. Uh, we can go ahead and take a break and then All dive right. into Why don't we do that? some Thank other you. interesting stuff. Thank you for listening to the Marketing Advisor Radio Show. We're going to take a short uh, profit center and <laughs> uh, come back after the break and speak a little bit more with uh, Scott Grant from uh, Standfast Asset Management. Thanks for listening. Good evening, folks. Welcome back. You're listening to the Marketing Advisor Radio Show. Um, as as I stated before, if you just tuned in, um, my name is Treg Keswick. I'm here with Rusty Winter, and we've got some very special guests here. Uh, let's see, we've got Jennifer Price, who is the publicist for uh, Scott Grant. Jennifer, welcome to the studio. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Scott Grant is president of uh, Standfast Asset Management, published and uh, accomplished author, local historian. We were discussing that in the first segment. Welcome to the studio. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks, Trey. It's great to be here. I'm That's having a blast. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. I, I wanted to open up this segment, this particular segment. Just share with us. You, obviously, you have a passion for history, and it, 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 it pervades everything that we do today, of course. But how do, what, tell me about your day job. What is it that you do? Well, what we do, you know, I, I run a company, we call ourselves Standfast Asset Management, and what we do is we're fiduciaries, and we manage money for people who trust us, and we charge a fee, and we don't make commissions 
Um, we don't, there's no transactional advantage to us. So I'm strictly, um, attempting to invest people's money in a way that is, uh, smart, reasonable, and successful. And I think what I do, the trick for me is that I lack certain emotions, or I, I at least don't allow them to rule me. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's, it's often said that the time that you want to be investing is when everything's bad, you know, when the news is bad. And that's when most people want to go hide in the corner. Right. And I'm there saying, let's buy. That's when uh, things are on sale. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and conversely, I mean, you have a lot of people rush into the market when things are high and when the news is all good. And, you know, that's the time we want to be more careful. Uh -huh. um, I'm a long-term investor. I don't like to trade a lot. I like to hold things for years, sometimes decades. Um, it's a hard thing to do if you're working with somebody who's transactionally based because they're not getting paid again until they buy and sell. Got it. And that's really, I think, what we do great is that we're only interested in making money for you. And because we're pay charging a fee based on the asset size, if I can make your assets increase, and typically the market goes up anywhere from 8 to 10% on average a year. Obviously, some years it goes down. We all know that. Remember 2008, 2009. Trying not could, to, but thanks. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, if I can get your money to, to increase, and I think our five-year return is around 9%. If I, can, if I can do that over a long enough period of time, it turns into real money. That's right. Very good. Yeah. What do you find to be oh, some of the... the biggest mistakes that people tend to make when when they don't have the benefit of somebody with with your particular skill set um, as, as an advocate you know I would say the biggest mistake obviously the emotions you know panic at the wrong time exuberance at the wrong time but the other is I think people think my dad used to have this saying and I, I he used to say it periodically he said if you build a better mousetrap people will beat a path to your door now, yeah. I don't know if you guys ever heard that one. It's I an old expression. Yeah, no, I've heard it. My yeah. father used to say something similar, yeah. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you can build the world's worst mousetrap, but if you advertise it well enough, you'll sell a lot of it. <laughs> you know, and you, you can build the greatest mousetrap in the world, and nobody knows about it. They're not going to buy it. Um, you know, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. We all know that. We learned it in grade school. What we didn't learn was that Eli Whitney made almost no money off the cotton gin. Right. And partially it was because he tried to uh, license it, um, and people found it was much easier just to build their own cotton gin in the, and, 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 and do it themselves. Yeah. And so he made almost no money off of it. And so that's really what I would say to people is don't go out looking for a great idea, you know, some great idea that you think is going to revolutionize the world or some new product that's more, uh, more than likely a hula hoop. Mm-hmm. Go with an established company with a big business, um, you know, and a, uh, Microsoft. There, it's a great, good, that's a good enough example. Microsoft is going to be around for a while. It's a big company. There will be tons of little companies that come out with new products in the in that sphere that we think are going to be great uh, as individuals. But more likely than not, the company that's going to end up making money off of that is going to be a Microsoft or a Google or an IBM and not the startup. Right. Um, so that's the biggest thing. Corporations are wonderful and profitable because they live forever. They're like Dracula or the Catholic <laughs> Church. Okay. And if you live long enough, if you live long enough, you accumulate a lot of value, a that's lot true. of wealth. And that's really what you're looking at with a lot of these corporations, Coca-Cola. You know, is Coca-Cola the greatest thing in the world? No. As it turns yeah. out, it's probably not all that good for us. Right. Diet Coke's it's even worse. Sugar water. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's been around a, lot, a while. It's a, it's a, it's, they've got a lot of money. They've got a lot of marketing muscle. Um, and if somebody comes up with something new, vitamin water was popular, Coke bought it. And you'll see the same thing again. So uh, what you want is a reasonable rate of return with a reasonable risk. You don't want spectacular rates of return because they come with spectacular risk. Right. And we can't afford spectacular risk because we have a life expectancy of 60, 70, 80 90 years, depending on, you know, where we are in life now. And whether you drink Coke or not a lot. Right. Yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> Apparently, yes. <laughs> Apparently. And then the other thing is, you know, corporations are around for hundreds of years in some cases. Uh, Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic Church has so much money because 
back in 400 or 600, people started giving them money and land. They've been around ever since. Right. Makes sense to me. So the takeaway from that is try to the best of your ability, take out the emotion involved with uh, with investing. Emotion will kill you in investing. Okay. Which is interesting because most decisions are made based on emotion. Emotion. That, so uh, that's a good a good thing to highlight. I mean, fine if you can't do it, if you're incapable of making those decisions on your own without an emotional pay the professionals then you yeah find somebody that can right and and i would argue most people are incapable yeah you you know frankly um i've sat down with many a prospect and said look you know you're probably a hindrance to me in doing this uh which you know it doesn't always go over all that well but that's the truth you know it doesn't right if you want to get involved you're probably going to make it worse nine out of ten times yeah. Was it Rusty? There's a, a phrase that you like to quote uh, speaking about the truth not being well received. The the, uh, uh, the risk the, of insult is the price of clarity. That's it. What is that again? The, the risk-, risk of insult is the price of clarity. I uh, use it all, almost every day. And what it simply means is that if you're um, and we, I use it from a like a copywriting perspective and an advert like a, a spot perspective, meaning if you don't have a couple people complaining about it. Then it probably didn't impact anybody, even yeah, in a good way. Probably didn't cut through clutter. And so I tell people that when they say, "Oh, I got an email saying, you know, my ad was aggravating," or something like that, I say, "Good. Did you, hopefully you get a couple more of those because that means it impacted probably, you know, exponentially more more people than that." Right. That says a lot about his latest headline, and I forced him to use this headline that says. Healthy dividends, skinny fees. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. And it got a lot of criticism. Really? And I said, great. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait to hear how many people hate that line. Absolutely. Because that means they're listening. And That's nowadays right. you're even going to get more of that. You know, if you use the word skinny in a headline, it's going to be something along the lines of you're bashing, you know, or you're you're going into those body stereotypes and stuff. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Right. It's just people's radars are up. Some people. I loved that it made people uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's what good. it was about. Absolutely. It should. It should. Speaking of uncomfortable, uh, Rusty. Uh-oh. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. Is there, we've got about one more minute left in this segment. And Well, uh, Scott, why don't you tell us if somebody wants to reach out to you, what wow. are some of the best ways to do that? That's why he's my sidekick. <laughs> Thanks, Rusty. That's great. Yeah, he's a good sidekick. I, I want to hire him. Uh, first off, I would say you can email me at scottg at standfastic.com. That's S-T-A-N-D-F-A-S-T-I-C dot com. Um, also, our phone number is area code 904-285-2130. Um, those would be the two best ways, at least initially. I, I give everybody my cell number. I'm suddenly balked at the idea of putting it on the air. <laughs> I wouldn't do yeah. <laughs> well, very good. Um, all right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, we're going to wrap up this segment. We'll come back after the break and um, delve into a little bit more about um, either some of your, your more recent uh, published articles, your columns, or... Uh, whatever you wish to share with our audience. I appreciate your coming, you spending your time here with it's, us. This has been great. This really has been a lot of fun. So, well, yeah, we'll well, we get to do it every segment. week. <laughs> You're listening to the Marketing Advisor Radio Show. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Jacksonville. You're listening to the Marketing Advisors on News 104.5 WOKV. We appreciate you joining us. We're having a great conversation today with Scott Grant and Jennifer Price. Um, you know, Scott's a man after my heart. Have you heard already? He, he's a historian and, uh, you know, as, as well as an asset manager. But like I always do, I focus on the history stuff. So I, I apologize there, Scott. But we I think we've uh, at least laced it with a little bit of uh, business, you know, business uh, topics. But we really appreciate having you having you on with us. Well, you know, thank you. And, it, you know, the history is kind of more interesting. Um, some people like stock portfolio management and i have some friends who do and we can talk about it for hours but a lot of people start glazing over when you start talking about (laughs) revenue growth and yield and beta and alpha i mean you know at some point i start losing people and the answer is 
Just, just let me do it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you don't like what I'm doing, fire me. <laughs> yeah. there's, no, there's nothing lost. Right. Your clients just, okay, can I trust this guy or not? I don't care what you're doing with it. Just make sure, it, make sure it works. And, you know, the trust is a big issue. You know, I like people to trust me, and um, we take that trust really seriously. Absolutely. People put the trust in you, then you have to, I, yeah. in my mind at least, you have an obligation to live up to that trust. Well, we were talking off air, and sometimes the best conversations come in between these, these on-air gonna, segments. I'm and I'm not going to let that happen anymore. I'm going to start turning that. the mic on. Yes, exactly. I think that's a that's a good yeah, idea. We, we have the secret tapes. We put those up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you hey, hey, seem to be behind-the-scenes tapes right. of the, didn't of the very, show. Didn't serve Nixon well, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's uh, so what we were talking about, you know, we I, I did. I invited you to our Rotary Club because I think it's a fantastic topic to, to come talk about. So it just kind of led to a conversation about public speaking and really practicing and being willing to fail and being willing to get up in front of people. And uh, sometimes you bomb. But I, I think we probably don't bomb as hard as we think we do. You know, I think we uh, think that people notice more than they really do. But talk a little bit about that, your experience with that and how that's going. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about that it was one of the earlier early Rotary Clubs we did when we were first putting the speech together. And it was a really small crowd. And they weren't that interested in the topic. I, I don't know that they would have been interested in any topic, frankly. Right. And I, you know, I just felt like I bombed. I felt like, uh, you know, that, the movie, uh, Tom Hanks movie, uh, where he talks, the kids talk about being a wind up monkey. I was the wind up monkey that day. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it was just awful. I, I, I was awful as a small crowd. And what we were saying is, you know, sometimes you just have to fail at something. You know, you just do. And uh, we talked about Jordan and Ruth. But my, my personal favorite is this. Um, Reggie Jackson. That's okay. my era. Mr. October. Three home runs in the 1977 World Series. Uh, what people don't often know about Re Reggie Jackson is that Reggie Jackson holds the lifetime strikeout record in the major league. No one really? in the history of baseball ever struck out more than Reggie Jackson. That's that's a, that's uh, saying something. There's a lot of strikeouts. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you remember he used to. I don't know how much you guys remember him from, but he's you know in my era. Right. Uh, he took a he took his cuts. I mean, he would look like a pretzel there uh, if he missed the ball. Um, but yeah, unless you're willing to strike out a lot, um, unless you're willing to fail a lot, Ray Kroc went bankrupt seven times. Yep. You, you're you're likely to not. Um, succeed because you're likely to not be trying hard enough if you're not failing and i think even uh president lincoln uh didn't win uh, he didn't win successfully uh, a bid for any position any government position until presidency and he, he ran it for a lot Is he, that he lost a lot of elections i think you know he's a congressman he is a congressman for two years, but he okay, does so lose. He did win that one. He, did, right. he does lose a lot until he wins the presidency, and right. he he loses to uh, Douglas in the fifty six Senate race, and comes back four years later and beats Douglas for president of the United States. So, so your history extends beyond that boundary of Duval <laughs> and the surrounding <laughs> well, counties. Yeah, <laughs> no, Lincoln. It's Lincoln. Yeah. Actually, you no. Know, there was some point people were complaining that uh, Trump had been bankrupt a lot. Mm -hmm. And a surprisingly large number of presidents have been bankrupt, including Lincoln, uh, Jefferson, Jackson. Uh, I can't remember the whole list, but there, there's a bunch of them. There's like eight or nine of them had, had bankruptcies. So, and you've had that experience in your public speaking life, yes, uh, of of experience in the failure. And, and oh yeah, you know, I've I've spoken off and on my entire life, and as he said, at this one Rotary Club, I was awful. But I've had some moments before where I was just. Uh, and you walk off the, and you wonder what you know what happened today that I was so bad because you want to be good, you want to sure be good you. for the people, and you want to be good for yourself, and you want to have that feeling like oh I did a good job, but at the same time sometimes you don't. I've been through that, you know. I've been through these presentations where it was the same exact presentation but a different audience, and I don't know, I couldn't picture why it didn't go as well as the the last time, and. Sometimes it can be little things like maybe I got an hour less sleep or I was stressed about something or maybe hungry or maybe it's just the way the audience reacts sometimes. I mean, if somebody's on their phone, that would just ruin a presentation for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, to a certain extent, I do think, you know, the audience sticks out in my mind, you know, yeah. the, the audience reaction. But 
obviously, if you're up there not doing a particularly engaging job, the audience isn't going to be engaged. Right, so they're going to be commensurate kind of, with you. Yeah, both sides of it, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, they, you've got to in, engage them, and then maybe they send back some energy to you um, that I, I think I clearly thrive on. Would you agree with that, Jennifer? Yeah, so you kind of feed off the energy? Definitely. It? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> but the, you know, that's it's true for so many aspects of life, and uh, not not just our our professional lives and our you know our our things that we find engaging, our hobbies like history and things like that. But uh, the, to have the courage to fail and to honestly assess where we really stepped in it, and um, identify the steps that we can take to improve the next time we do it and to actually get up and do it that next time. I think that's really what separates the the, the girls from the women. No, I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. No, I think you're right. And again, you know, look, it, I don't think anybody or very few people walked into a, into any kind of profession or avocation and were just great on day one. No. You know, everybody who ever ended up great failed a lot. Um you know, in almost anything. Necessary. Yep. Right. Right. I mean, look at Rusty. <laughs> 17 years of failure. <laughs> I haven't. Well, we've been doing this show for four years. I don't know if we've had a great one yet. Uh, and it's all my fault, really. I think this one's really this good. One, this yeah, this one's be really good. good. This one's good to it. I think we're, we're on to something. I think it's largely because of you, Rusty. I don't know. I Treg would, yeah. No, no, no. I, I think uh, Rusty is bringing a lot to this Treg, show. Treg's emails during the week wouldn't reflect that at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what other advice can you give uh, budding business folk out there? Uh, to uh, help them in their in their journey towards success. Well, you know, I would say this um, as a general proposition. I think that success comes from execution more than planning, and that you know, there's a lot of really great plans out there, but if they're not executed well, um, they're just not going to succeed. You could probably have a mediocre plan and execute it well, and and do very very well in life. Execution, in my mind, is everything. Um, I've been working with Jennifer on coming up with some analogies that were not sports related. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes hard to do. Yeah. But, but, you know, you look at a guy like Urban Meyer, who's a he hero around here. Um, you know, does Urban Meyer come up with the greatest tactical football plan? Or does Urban Meyer get his guys to buy into the plan? And I would argue it's the latter. I mean, you know, right. those guys are on board with the, with the Urban Meyer plan. And that's why he had success at Florida and why he's had success at Ohio State is because the kids believe. Right. And it's not that it's the greatest X's and O's. And I'm not saying he's not a good X and O guy. I'm just saying that he gets those kids to buy in. And um, I think in business, you got to buy in. you got to be 100%, 110% there. Well done is better than well said. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with driving up and down 95 or uh you see that that trout contracting sign they they put these cool phrases up there the latest one is uh after all is said and done you've said more than you've done <laughs> so, i like that i do too so i think i'm gonna rip off and duplicate that's my r d department you've been listening to the marketing advisor radio show we will return after the break Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to the Marketing Advisors on News 104.5 WOKV. This is Rusty Winter. I am Treg Kazakh's sidekick, according to Treg. I but like I like that. being here anyway. His his mic is actually positioned better, and it's bigger than mine. So maybe I maybe I am the sidekick. But anyway, we're joined by Scott Grant and Jennifer Price. We've had a great first three segments, and I have no doubt that this last and our fourth and last segment is going to be just as good. So, you know, I am going to veer to history in a minute, but there is a, you know, a serious business question I want to ask you. And it's it's really when you when you talk about advisors and asset managers, that fee versus commission question, I know that you are a fee guy. And so I wanted you to explain that a little bit. And what what are the advantages when you charge fees versus commissions? Well, I think the biggest advantage, and anytime somebody sells you something, they're selling you something um, for a reason, and usually that reason is some sort of a commission. It doesn't matter whether it's a new roof or a car or a dishwasher or a mutual fund or an annuity. And there's a guy on TV, in fact, uh, 
Um, he, he may even do radio ads with you guys. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you guys do Fisher? Does Fisher do radio ads with you? Fisher? I don't know. Uh, not my account. But okay. On the, well, it's a big, it, it would be a big one, Treg. <laughs> <laughs> you would know if it was yours. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Fisher starts out his TV commercials, which I see almost every single day, and he says, I would rather burn in hell than sell someone an annuity. Um, yeah. The commissions on an annuity happen to be really huge, sometimes as much as 10%. So if I'm trying to sell you an annuity, a valid question is, do I, you know, is this in my best interest or does he just want to make a 10% commission? Right. What makes us different is we charge an asset base fee, usually between half of a percent and three quarters of a percent, which is very low and is low by design. Uh, we don't think we can be successful for you if we charge you too much money. Um, so when I decide that I want to sell, as I recently did, I sold some, our General Mills stock. And we put the money, or at least most of the money, into Amgen. I mean, I didn't do that because I was making a fee to sell your General Mills stock and buy your Amgen. I did it because I thought that would make you more money. And I did the same thing for myself. And it's worth pointing out again, you know, we're a fiduciary. And what's a fiduciary do? He does what a reasonable person would do. And so I, I you know, in addition, I'm a lawyer, so I'm a double fiduciary for my clients. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do what we think is in your best interest. Does that mean that we always are right? No. I make mistakes, you know, and I've lost some money over the years at times. Um, but that's why you're a long-term investor. It's not it's not quarter over quarter so much as eh, decade over decade, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, if you can make 10% on your money, you double it every seven years. So if you sit there and you put a you know $10,000 in, in 14 years, you should have something around 40. In 21 years, somewhere around 80. Um, in 28 years, somewhere around 160. As you can see, the numbers start getting really big. Mm. And I talk about compounding. I usually tell this story. My grandmother loved ice cream, loved it, more than most humans should like anything. <laughs> And, uh, you know, when ice cream cost a dime, she had no problem. When the price doubled to 20 cents, no problem. When it doubled to 40 cents, no problem. When it doubled to 80 cents, again, no problem. But when it doubled to $1.60, it blew her mind. <laughs> that you was know? her threshold. Though. Yeah, that was her <laughs> threshold. And, you know, of course, like everybody who's older, they, you know, walk around, I used to pay a dime for this, yeah. you know. <laughs> but it's just doubling every time. And the compounding factor over a long enough period of time. Yeah. Right. So you say to me, Treg, you know, I want to be a billionaire. And my answer to you is I can make you a billionaire if you give me enough time. Unfortunately, probably for most of us, a lifetime yeah. is not enough time. I'm not going to be around here 500 years, so medical <laughs> can we technology speed this could up a catch bit? up with us. Right. And that's, <laughs> again, that's a mistake people make. But back to, to Rusty's question um, we're on the same side of the table. You know, we want you to make money. We don't want to risk your money too much. At the same time, you can't make money within, in the type of investing we do, which is predominantly stocks and some bonds, but predominantly stocks. You're not going to make money in that without some risk. Yeah. But I want to keep the risk as low as I can, and I want to compound over time at a reasonable rate of return. So you mentioned a half to three quarters of a percent of a point, right? Is is the yeah, that's usually our fee. Yeah. Okay. On the assets under management. Is Correct. That, how do you determine assets under management? Is it just what's what's in the market? It's, just, it's just what's in the account with us. I see. Okay. So if somebody had, let's say, say a hundred thousand uh, dollars, we would probably charge them three quarters of a percent, which would be seven hundred fifty dollars a year, broken up in four quarterly payments. Gotcha. And the nice thing is if you decided after nine months that you hated us, you know, you didn't, you, we didn't do a good job or you didn't like the way my face looked when you came in, <laughs> you could leave. And there's really, you know, there's no penalty for that. You just take the money and go someplace else. Well, you mentioned Nobody ever leaves us, by the way. Right. Well, I, I can't imagine. At least for that face reason. Right. <laughs> that couldn't no, for, happen. It, it's a funny <laughs> just... thing. For a long time, we had nobody left, leave. For for over a decade, I had no clients leave. I have had a couple, um, but it's very rare that somebody leaves us. Most of our clients are um, pretty in, I started to say happy, then I started to say in love with us. 
it's more than just happy. Pe- well, people, are, mean, people that, that deal with us are fans. You mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that the average rate of return is somewhere between 6 and 9%. I think it was on a segment earlier in this, this show. And if the fee is 750 if my math is right, then they're earning anywhere between, for $100,000 assets under management, that's six to 9000 and paying seven fifty. Is that yeah, that's probably about right. I actually said eight to ten, but oh, that's okay. a, that's the historical numbers. Depending whether you go back to twenty five or if you go back to uh, forty five, I think is the two is the two periods that people uh, usually look at. There's no real good data before nineteen twenty five. All right. Well, I think we can. Uh, <laughs> we're almost at 2025, so <laughs> we're knocking on the door of 100 years of history. I think we're good. <laughs> this is where I start glazing over. All those numbers are flying by. Can we revert to history again for sure. a second? <laughs> I know we don't have much longer. So I did want to ask you, though, what are you diving into next in terms of your historical research and all that good stuff? Well, you know, I... I, I there's a story that I've always liked um, about a guy who was governor of New York. His name is Fuller Warren, and that name's obviously familiar to us because there's the big bridge, Fuller Warren Bridge. And he's a, he's just a nifty guy. He uh, he gets elected, I think, in the uh, 50s. And uh, one of the things he does is he, he, he introduces a bill to the state legislature that makes it illegal to wear to wear a hood in public. Hmm. Huh. And if you think about it for a second, you'll know what hood I'm talking about. That you didn't want people wearing the hoodies. Mm-hmm. No, the oh, no, white I'm, hood. I know, I'm yeah. just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but he he also wrote a book about, uh, in fact, the title of the book is How to Win an Election or something, something like that. And uh, he's a great campaigner. He, uh, he, uh, he believes strongly in barbecues and beauty queens. Oh, mm, I do too. <laughs> Was that his slogan? You no. vote for me? <laughs> no, actually, actually, barbecues and beauty queens came from Jennifer. Jennifer's awesome. <laughs> oh, all right. Very good. That might be our new slogan. Okay. <laughs> Let's Stand go fast. Ahead. Asset management, barbecues and beauty queens. Hey, some things never change, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's tons of pictures of the guys with uh, a fuller with um, with both beauty queens and at barbecues. And he, he, he liked them both. And uh, a good campaigner, good governor. Yeah. Well, how did uh, so a, a New York governor get a name on a bridge in Jacksonville, Florida? No, he, he's governor of Florida. Oh, I thought he, you said New York or something. Did I, did I, I, I'm sorry. If, yeah. If I said New York, it was just a slip of the tongue. I didn't. I don't I remember you. saying it, but if I did, I was slipping out. No, he was Florida governor. I think. I kind of think from 51 to 53, but you caught me off guard a little. And it, it, but it's bit roughly in that area. So I wonder how upset he would be if he knew that his bridge was always under construction. Right. <laughs> He'd be mad as heck. I'm telling you right now. He, he'd be mad as heck that that bridge needs needs work all the time. He'd have a barbecue that, and charge a cover and just get it done <laughs> once and for all and, and be done with it. He'd, like have, he'd have some sort of event. He would. Yeah. He'd have some sort of event, and he'd be there. Uh, he had. He used to wear the the most um, these wingtip shoes. These you know really elaborate wingtip shoes, and he'd be there in his wingtips with the beauty queen on both arms, and that bridge would be done. Very good. That's awesome. Well, fun, fun stuff. Um, I, I just Googled Fuller Warren. I'm going to spend the rest of my afternoon and evening reading about him. So <laughs> there goes my night. Uh, have fun, kids. <laughs> anyway, we, we appreciate everybody joining us uh, on the Marketing Advisor Show. Of course, tune in again next next Saturday. We'll be, we'll be right back here on News 104.5 WOKV. If you want to find Treg or I or information on any of the, the folks that we interview, An easy way to do it, just search Marketing Advisors Jacksonville on your favorite search engine, and if we're doing our job, we'll show up. You could also just go to WOKV.com and uh, do a little navigating. You'll find us pretty easily. You've been listening to News 104.5 WOKV.